Good evening. Yep. When he said you'll find out, that's what he meant. Just like that. Uh, I'm pumped to be here. As Brenda said, my name is Ben. I am the pastor of multiplication networking here at Grace Point. If you want to know what that means, come ask me. And, and I'll take five minutes to explain kind of what I do here. Uh, but one of the things that I get to do, not even as a part of my job, but because I love this ministry so much, is I get the opportunity just to preach and to teach and to present Jesus to y'all. Uh, as Brennan said, I, I was a former Oasis pastor. Uh, and it's not just because of that that this ministry means a ton to me. Uh, in 2006, on a not as hot day in late September, I gave my life to Jesus in this ministry when it was meeting over in the activity center, which most of you have no idea what that is. And so this ministry for me, a little bit, when I came back in 2019, is like coming home. And so I love to get to be here. And as I think just every time I get ready to preach, I always just am grateful and praising God for what he's done in my life. And as I think about my life and I think about just the last 17 years of what it's looked like to follow Jesus, there have been a lot of ups and downs. There are things in my life that I've had to surrender or let go. There are things in my life that I know God has changed within me and desire for me to change. And in the last 17 years, I've wrestled with this continual question on what does it look like for me to grow as a follower of Jesus? But it's not a question, and that specific question, that's always just asked in the church. Uh, we are in a time in a world where that question over and over again is getting asked. Most of us even, I would argue, care about being kind of the best person that we can be. Uh, other people phrase it like, what does it look like to reach your full potential? Growing as a better human in our relationships and in our interaction, what does that look like? And so, even so much so, that there's this thing around New Year's Eve that we've created called New Year's Resolutions, and we enter into a season of saying, a new year, new me. And, and we adopt these things and these statements saying, all right, I'm not going to do this, or you're going to add something to your life. And we have these resolutions that we try to follow so that we can become better versions of ourselves. I mean, walk into any bookstore. And you'll find dozens, if not hundreds, of books helping you be the best person you can be. What does it look like to reach your full potential? Right? There's self-help books. Uh, just overall, and what, again, what does it mean to be a better person? There's self-help books for women, for men, for 20-somethings and 18 and 19-somethings, for self-esteem, about relationships, productivity, money, business, positive thinking, self-help books about mindfulness. There's even self-help books that contradict each other. There's a book by, I gotta look at it because I'm not gonna, by Shonda Rhimes called The Year of Yes, where she talks about how one full year she said, she decided in her head she was gonna say yes to everything that was presented for her and how it completely changed her life. And yet there's another book that's a self-help book that falls into this that's called The Power of Saying No. The science to say no that puts you in charge of your life. Which one are you supposed to do? There's books on books. There's podcasts on podcasts. There's TED Talks on TED Talks. There's sermons on sermons. How to be a better you. And so we come to this moment, I think, where we're continually asking ourselves this question. And it's a reflective question for tonight. Is how do we ultimately become better people? And we wrestle with this. And society points us to this. And it's not a bad thing. And those things, I'm not trying to bash like being a better person. Like that, those things can be really good. But between atomic habits and seven things to make you an effective person, I don't know which one to read. They're just, it's all over. But what's beautiful about Christianity, what's beautiful about the gospel, and what's beautiful about our Savior and King Jesus is that he invites us into something different. You see, the self-help books, what they tend to do, or these teachings or podcasts or TED Talks, what they tend to do is they fit into three specific categories. One, they fit into either a mechanical category where they give you the techniques and practices on what you need to adopt in your life to become that better person. So it can be mechanical or they, they fit into this morality or moral category. This is the world's answer for becoming a better person where they say, just try harder to be virtuous. Think about the virtuous. Think about that which is good and right in life and just try to run after those things. Or they might fit into this category of, of the magical Tap into some kind of power. Tap into this thing. You'll become a better person. I mean, meditation is all the rage right now, and it should be adopted in a way that helps us not just answer a question about how we become better people, 
but to enter into an invitation of Jesus where he offers a different way of thinking. You see, Jesus' way is not a secular technique or new age spirituality. It's, it's both, it's none of those, it transcends all those, the, the categories of mechanical and, and moral and magical. There's aspects of that in Jesus' way of living life, in Jesus' way of helping us change and become the people he's created to be, but it actually transcends all those too because it's that different. You see, the invitation of Jesus is not to just be a better person. It's an invitation to a life of complete transformation. It's not just about helping you get to a spot where you can make the right decisions all the time. Where people look at you and think, man, he's just a good guy. Jesus's way of life, Jesus's invitation is about transformation. He's comp completely come to change how we live, how we do relationships, how, how we fit into our purpose and what he's, how he's created us to be. But not in just be a better person way, in complete transformative ways. You see, Jesus asked questions like, how can a selfish person become unselfish? How can a controlling person, a manipulative person, become a liberator of people? How can a cowardly person become courageous? How can a whiner become a giver? How can a worrier become a rock? How can a bigot become understanding or loving? How can someone who's going through the depths of hell in their life where circumstances all around them are falling apart and yet still experience peace. You see, Jesus' invitation for us is not just to be a better person. He's come that we would experience holistic transformation. That's his invitation. So when we are in the third week of our I Am series tonight, Jesus says, I am the true vine. And so we're gonna open up the word. If you have a Bible, open it up. If you don't have a Bible, there's some out in the, the foyer. You can get one at the info center. We're gonna open up to John 15 and we're gonna enter into this way of life that Jesus has invited us into, invite us into transformation. Starting with John 15, I'm gonna read in verse one. It says this, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. Jesus' invitation into living a life with him is not just about being a better person. He's inviting us into holistic transformation by saying, I'm the true vine and that's the branches. The first thing that we learn in these first few verses is that we learn that Jesus is committed to our transformation. Jesus is committed to our transformation. When he says this imagery of vine and branch, his audience would have known and had an image and exactly know at least a picture of what he was talking about, not only in their head, but probably while they were most likely outside, while he probably told this story over and over again, while he told these people, his followers and disciples, that he was the vine and they were the branches, most likely one of those times, they were actually in or around a vineyard so they could see it. In the Old Testament, Israel was actually known or called the vine in certain ways. And yet Israel, time and time again, we read in the Old Testament, they would not produce and bear the fruit which God had intended them to produce. So when Jesus comes and says, I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus has come as the one true vine that has come to bring about the purposes of God into the world that Israel couldn't without him. And so they know this imagery. There's vineyards everywhere. They know what it looks like. They know the relationship between the vine and the branches. Now, I don't know about you. I have not had a lot of experience in vineyards or even I've never seen a vineyard in real person in my life. But what, from what I know about them and more so what I read about them this week uh, is the reality is at least for me, like here's how my brain works sometimes is I'll think like vine and branches and I'll immediately separate it into two different things. Right, here's the vine, here's the branches, there's two purposes, there's two things, all right, what does it look like? When a Jewish person hearing the words of Jesus saying, I'm the vine, you are the branch, the picture they're going to, and, and once they would look out and see a vineyard, what they would see is not two different aspects of the plant, they would see in a vineyard, oh, this is a place where the vine grows. You see, it's not two distinct parts 
that make up one thing. It's a symbiotic relationship between two things that are one, the vine and the branch. They contain the same essence, the same life. There is one plant, not a twofold distinction. The function of the vine is to pump life into the branches and the function of the branch is to produce the fruit of the vine. When we look at a vineyard, we would recognize it as that a place where the vine grows. The material that makes up the branch is the same exact material that makes up the vine. Not two different plants, one plant accomplishing the function for which it was always intended. And the material that makes it up is the same. Symbiotic relationship between two. You could say the two are one. And so Jesus, in being committed to our transformation, is saying, I am actually the key to this change and transformation for your life. As the vine, I am the key the foundation in which you need to stay connected to in order for fruit to be born out of your life, to be produced in your life. And so since the vine and the branch are not two distinct entities, but one, he's committed to you as the key to make the change in you and the transformation in you. He knows that you will actually not bear any fruit or produce anything. You will not experience transformation without him. And this is an interesting statement, and I might throw some people off, but I'm okay with it. As much as the branch needs the vine, Jesus, in choosing us to bear fruit in the world, he is saying the vine needs the branch as well. Not two distinct parts. One symbiotic relationship made of the same essence, and that essence is the life and light of Jesus. We're saying as the vine, as the one that gives nutrients and food and flows into the branch. I'm the one who gives you life. As the vine, I'm committed to your transformation and your change, the fruit that you're gonna produce because I know that that fruit is gonna go and change the world and you cannot produce that fruit without me. So I'm committed to your transformation. He's saying he's the key to it. So he's committed to it. Another way that at least I think I kind of see this is in verse two, Jesus says, that, sorry, I ducked down. Jesus says that, uh, well, verse one, we'll go. He is the vine, the true vine, and his father uh, is the gardener. Some say vine dresser. And so he, it gives us this, this picture of, of, obviously, a vineyard and what it looks like for a gardener to operate with the vine and the branches. So Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, the father is the gardener. And he says, what the gardener will do is the gardener will prune the branches so that more fruit will be able to go. He says, I I pruned the branches which bear fruit so that they will be able to bear more fruit. A second way that Jesus, that God, is committed to our transformation is he does some things that hurt sometimes, but for our benefit, for our growth, for our transformation. You throw the picture back up for me, I'm sorry. So as you look at this, all we see here is obviously the fruit, The fruit at the very top there, you see the branch right now. What we can't see is the vine. Here, what a gardener would do after they harvested this fruit, they would look and see on this branch and every other branch that's attached to the vine and see where were the branches not producing any fruit. And they would cut those, and the gardener would cut those branches off. But even for this piece of fruit right here, these grapes that were harvested, he would look at this and say, is there aspects of this branch that has produced this fruit that need to get pruned, that need to be cut off, that need to be ripped off, off, so that next year, in next year's harvest, there will be even more fruit. He cuts off that which in us is not bearing anything or is keeping us from bearing fruit, from producing fruit, so that we can produce more fruit. Again, I've never been a part or seen a vineyard a lot. Like, I don't know how it works. I'm not a master. My mother-in-law's a master gardener, which is really cool. I don't even know really what that means, but she just knows a lot about plants. And because she knows a lot about plants, my wife has decided that she gets to know a lot about plants too. And so we have a lot of random things in our house, mainly in our living room, but about every three months or so, a new plant shows up in our house. And at some point, our plants are gonna be so aggressively, like we're gonna have so many that we're not gonna be able to find our children because they're gonna be hiding in the plants. But what my wife has learned as the gardener of these plants, she has learned that there comes a point with some of these plants that the pot that they are in is so restrictive that the plant can no longer grow. So we actually, I actually encouraged her in this. We bought a new plant today. 
This is the plan. I didn't even know what it is. I didn't ask. I wouldn't have remembered. But we got a new plan today. If we were to keep this plant in this little plastic pot that we were given with it, it would not grow. It would be restricted. There's no room for movement. And so what a good gardener would do is they would get a bigger plant and they would move it from its old space, where it was at, where it can't grow, where it's restricted, to this new pan that has more room so the roots can go deeper, so the branches could grow, so more fruit could be produced. But sometimes, as branches, we live in a way that there are things keeping us from growing. There are things keeping us from staying in this spot and not being able to experience the holistic transformation that Jesus has to offer. You sometimes in our life, we have things like relationships that keep us from experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus has for us. When I was a freshman, 2006, in college, gave my life to Jesus. I I came from a past that was just filled with a lot of brokenness, a lack of hope, um, of not a lot of purpose, didn't know who I really was. But I came to Oasis one night, heard the gospel and the good news, heard an invitation to say yes to Jesus, and something within me just shouted, you need him. So I said yes. What I didn't realize is that in that, there were relationships in my life, friendships in my life, relationship with some family members in my life, that if I had kept them going, were gonna restrict me from experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus had for me. So it's not that I didn't love the people that were in my life. It's I recognized that if I kept staying in the same rhythm and relationship and kept doing the same things I was doing with these people, I was going to block access for Jesus to be able to do what he has called and what he's desiring to do within me and having me experience a full abundant life that he has come to offer. So I had to make some decisions. And that was hard. Because it didn't mean I didn't love those people anymore. It meant I had to reevaluate and change what the relationship looked like so I could press into what God had for me. But sometimes it's not just relationships. Sometimes we sit and want to stay in the pot because we fear the unknown of what God is actually getting us into. Like, this is known. This is comfortable. Where we're at right now. I have some good rhythms in my life. Like, I, I come to Oasis Sunday night. I think about Sunday morning. I'm, I'm going to a small group. I went, I don't know if I'm gonna go back, but Brennan told me to go back, so I'm probably gonna go back. But there's just things in my life that like, I'm just comfortable. And yet there's this pull that you know that Jesus has more for you. And it's not meant to be a burden to make you feel guilty for what you don't have or not are pressing into yet. It's the reality that the flesh within you and selfishness within you, the known of what is here against the the unknown of what is next and what Jesus has for you is hard to press into. Sometimes what keeps us here is just thought processes. Some of you in here just, you struggle with self-worth. Over and over again, you're thinking and you're, you're debating. You said yes to Jesus, but you sit and you think, man, how can Jesus really forgive and love me with who I am and what I've done? Maybe you struggle with self-worth and, and you don't see yourself as God sees you. And it keeps us here restricted, not be able to grow. But what sometimes, and I'm gonna say all the time, but what, what a good gardener, what our good father will do is he will actually take us out. Is he won't really give you the choice sometimes. I'm gonna screw this up somehow. Is he won't give you the choice. Is he'll gently loosen you up, try to get you ready and prepared to enter into the next phase he has for you. And as he pulls you out, it hurts and it's uncomfortable and I'm not ready but he'll remove those things in your life that are keeping you from experiencing the full growth that he has for you. And he'll put you there. So sometimes, even though you haven't made the choice, he'll make the choice for you to say no to a couple friendships and relationships. Sometimes he'll call you to somewhere else, even when you don't want to go. Maybe he'll call you into something that you aren't prepared for, you don't think you're ready for, but he knows it's for your good. And he puts you into a spot, into a place where you can experience full life, full goodness, full joy, full, complete transformation. You see, the gardener, who is our father, who is good, 
is committed to our transformation. So sometimes he puts us in places that we're not ready for, ready to grow in, but are necessary for us. I am sorry, Jana, I'm making a mess. And he puts us in this place because now there's room to grow. There's room to experience and see the goodness of God in life. There's room to experience as later on in this chapter in John 15 that we're not gonna read together where he says, I say these things to you that you may have life and have it abundantly. And sometimes we just need to be forced to be put in a place where we have to go, even though it feels really gross and it's hard and uncomfortable, that's okay. But God's committed to your transformation. He's committed to producing the fruit in you that is ultimately his fruit for the transformation of the world. The second thing that we learn here that Jesus has for us in this idea of transformation, of complete holistic change, is that transformation is not a command, but the promise. Transformation is not a command, but the promise. In John 15, 5, he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, if you remain in me, he says, you will bear fruit. You will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Transformation. This life, abundant life with Jesus. The change that he desires to produce within us is not the command, it's the promise. He's saying, remain in me, you're going to bear much fruit. So then we have to define, well, what is fruit, right? Anytime bearing fruit is mentioned in the New Testament, it almost always has to do with character. Nothing to do with personality. God doesn't want to change how he created you. If you're an introvert, you're an introvert. God bless you. There are probably self-help books for like, how to, as an introvert, how to do well in large groups. I don't know. I'm an extrovert, so like, and there are also self-help books as an extrovert, how to get alone because people are probably sick of you a little bit. But if that's who you are, that's who you are. That's not the change that Jesus desires to produce in you. It's not a personality thing. It's a character thing. So when I asked those questions before, I'm assuming one or two hit home. Jesus desires to answer the question, how can you experience peace in the midst where there's absolutely no hope? What does it look like for you to experience true fullness of joy, as Psalm 16 says, as David says in Psalm 16, fullness of joy in the presence of God, even when everything in your life is falling apart? What's beautiful and what's great is that we don't just have an illustration, is that we have a definition of this fruit. If you've been in the church long enough, you've known this phrase, you've heard this phrase, it's called the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So this fruit that Jesus desires to produce in you for the transformation of yourself and of the world is what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in you abiding in you, you abiding in him to produce that fruit, love. A sacrificial love. A love that says, I desire God's best for you, not even just your best for you. Because sometimes if it's me, it's like, the way my wife can love me the best sometimes is, is not pressing into and, 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 and entering into what I think is best for me. She challenged me, encouraged me in ways that she knows it's God's best for me. How is that producing you? Not through your own power and control. It's remain in Jesus. Joy. Peace. As Paul calls it in Philippians, a peace which surpasses understanding. You see your experience and there will be a peace produced in you that you can't even define or really explain to people. But you know it when you know it. It's a peace that there's calmness beneath the storm of the life that's on the outside but it's a recognition and a pointing to help us remember who's in control and that there's still hope even when all looks hopeless. Patience. Now, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes there's people in my life that are really, really hard to forgive. And if it was just up to me, I wouldn't forgive them. Forgiveness and patience is a fruit that Jesus produces in us. Kindness, unselfishness, goodness, transparency and integrity, goodness, integrity, a fruit produced by Jesus. Not something that we have to try really hard at. Because he's saying, that's not the command. That's not what I'm asking you to do. 
saying, remain in me and you will bear this fruit. Faithfulness, courage, gentleness, humility, self-control. This is the one that's a little tough for me to kind of define and, and understand fully. Because what Jesus, or what Paul is saying is that self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. And what Jesus is saying is I can't produce self-control within me, at least apart from him, I won't have self-control. But with him, I'll be able to experience self-control. So in my life, as I look back, there have been moments where, for me, I was introduced to, to porn at a very young age by my dad, saying it was okay to press into. It was okay to, to experience. And the way he told me about it, he said, just don't tell your mom. And so from eight years old until I was 19, I thought porn was okay. And for a million reasons that I'm not going to get into, it's not. There's objectification. There's hurt and oppression. There's sinning against yourself and God when we do that. And we look at it. So for me, hearing for the first time, classically, at a spring break trip to Panama City Beach with Campus Crusade, and they did the classic men and women thing. It's like the girls go over here and you talk about things, and the guys go over here and we're going to talk about how bad we are with the porn thing. And we're talking about like, and, and people are going around, it's like, I struggle with porn, I struggle with porn. And in my head, I'm like, what do you struggle with? Like, I didn't know it was a bad thing. And all of a sudden, there's like, there's this, this revelation, like, man, I'm entering into this thing. It's just not what God has for me or wants for me. And so for me, self-control is like every time I had the temptation, it's like I just got to not try as hard as I can. And every time that I had that approach, I failed. But when I learned to abide in Jesus, to rest and remain in him, and we'll talk about what that looks like in a little bit, all of a sudden, it wasn't me who was able to stop and, and say no when the temptation arrived. There was a Holy Spirit-driven power that was produced in self-control that I was able to experience freedom and overcome sin. It wasn't me trying as hard as I could, as hard as I could, because every time I did it, I failed. It was a remaining in Jesus and a Holy Spirit produced fruit that was able to help me experience freedom. So the second thing he says here, it's, it's not just that you remain in me, you bear fruit. He's actually saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. The most basic point of this imagery is the obvious dependence of branches on the vine for their continued life. I have a branch. This was a part of a tree at one point. I would have felt really guilty if I had pulled this off, but it was laying in our yard, so I blame my children. If we all got together and used all of our mind power and all of our will and all of the strength that is within us, just here, could we produce any kind of fruit on this branch? No. Like, we could try and we could try and we could shake it and like we could tape a fruit on it, but that didn't produce fruit. It was manufactured and it was fake. The branch is useless, not connected to the vine. When Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he's saying sometimes some of you are taping fruit to yourself in order to produce that thing, but it's fake and manufactured. You're trying hard and you're sitting there and you're, oh, patience, be there. Blah. I'm trying to be loving, but you're just really hard to love and I'm trying, but I failed again. Because we're just trying really hard. And when we try really hard to produce a thing that we can't produce in ourselves, that only the Holy Spirit within us can produce, we not only fail, but we get discouraged. And then Christianity becomes this guilt-ridden, shame-ridden, life that Jesus did not intend for us. The branch has no chance apart from the vine. We can try, but nothing is going to happen. Jesus is saying, when you're not remaining in me, abiding in me, you're out trying hard and you're laboring in vain. He's saying, if you're not abiding in me, you will not have fruit that lasts. He's saying, no fruit is going to happen, but instead, he says, whoever remains in me, the ESV version of the Bible says, abides in me, bears much fruit. Your transformation, Jesus is saying, is guaranteed. It's the promise, not the command. And so to bear fruit, he says, remain in me, 
And the Greek word for abide or remain means to wait for, to continue to exist, or to remain in existence. To abide in Jesus is to remain in the Father's heart. To remain and rest in Jesus is to remember whenever you can the Father's love for you. I heard a story of of a Korean pastor who has literally led millions of people through his church that he leads to Jesus. And he'll come and he'll speak at events and he'll come to America and he'll talk with pastors and he'll meet people and he'll meet Christians and he just, he gets sad sometimes when he leaves. Because what he says is, he phrases it this way, he says, people want to meet with Moses when they could run up to the mountaintop and stand face to face with God. And sometimes in our Christianity, we get so attached to a person or to people or to a ministry like Oasis, which I love, or to a church like Grace Point, which I love. We get so attached to them that we say, like, I just want to, I want a selfie with Moses when I could actually run up the mountain and meet with Jesus. And what I'm not saying is don't be a part of those things. But what I am saying is sometimes we replace the reality that we have access to the living God who died for our sins and who was raised again. And yet instead, we want to stay connected or meet with someone or be with someone that isn't Jesus himself. We miss this idea and we don't fully understand, I think, and comprehend sometimes that we have access to the vine, to the gate, to the good shepherd. So to abide in Jesus is to remain in the Father's heart starts with remembering that you have access to him. Is that your longing? Is your longing him? Is your desire Jesus? Because to abide in him doesn't start with what specific spiritual discipline should you adopt It starts with a desire and a longing to actually want to be with Jesus and desire him above all else. And I say to abide in Jesus means to remain in the Father's heart because it's how Jesus defined it. In verse nine, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. I think a lot of times we come to this, a lot of times, like, at least for me, it's like to remain or abide in Jesus, we go right to, what does it look like for me? That means I have to meet with him which is true. But what we end up doing is that we replace meeting with Jesus or having access and remaining in his love, remembering who he is for us with the spiritual disciplines and the practices that we put in place and think that the spiritual disciplines and practices are the one that actually do the transformation and not Jesus himself. So we say, if I pray this much, if I go to church this much, if I read my Bible, or I know this much Bible, if I enter into silence and solitude or practice the Sabbath, like those are the things that are gonna transform me and and connect me with Jesus. They are the ones that are gonna produce the fruit within me. Man, if I'm struggling with patience or love for someone or forgiving someone, I just, I gotta go pray more and I gotta read the Bible more. What Jesus is saying, and what I wanted to get, just highly get across, is that spiritual disciplines are not the things in which the fruit is produced. Spiritual disciplines are the vehicles that help us respond to the love of God. They're the things that help us remember that we are the branch and Jesus is the vine. According to Jesus, the follower of Christ is the recipient of the love of God. As Jesus explains, the very love of the Father for the Son has been distributed, has been given to every disciple who says yes to Jesus. So this command to remain in Jesus, or as the ESV says, to abide in Jesus, is not just a meeting with the person of Jesus. That's a part of it. It's not just the participation with the person, Jesus, which is important, but it's a participation in the nature of God. It is a dwelling, staying, living in the love of God. Someone who I I read a commentary over this said, the disciples are the recipients of this Trinitarian love, this love of the Father, love of the Son, and love of the Holy Spirit. It says the command to remain, to abide, encourages the disciple to understand their need to respond to this love. Remain in his heart. 
this abiding, remembering his heart for you, knowing where you stand with him and desiring to abide, to stay, to remain, to continue to exist in the Father's heart for you. This last week as I was preparing and knowing like I was gonna talk about the mind, uh, we do Wednesday morning staff prayer every Wednesday morning. And our development pastor, Pastor Aaron Cloud, who's just a great man of God, a great friend of mine. Um, he's been reading this book by Andrew Murray called Abide in Christ. And, and so he read just a couple different sentences from this book. And it perfectly for me, at least, kind of helped me understand this definition and what it meant to really abide in Jesus. It helped me move from this moment of, I think, abiding, remaining is making sure I'm praying enough, making sure I'm spending my, my morning devo, making sure I'm practicing the Sabbath, making sure I'm showing up to corporate worship, which all those things are important. But it moved from like, I'm not prioritizing those things. I'm prioritizing wanting and desiring to be with Jesus. And those are the vehicles in which they're reminders of me, how much God actually loves me because he showed me through his son. This is what Andrew Murray said. He says, on my part, on our part as disciples of Jesus, abiding is nothing but the acceptance of my position, the consent to be kept there, the surrender of faith to the strong, to the strong vine. I can only yield myself to your love with the prayer that day by day, you would reveal to me the precious mysteries of such knowledge. And so encourage and strengthen me to do what my heart longs to do indeed, ever only holy to abide in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight.